My name is Doug Peterson. I'm a regional soil health conservationist with NRCS. And today I just want to talk to you a little bit about the economics of soil health and conservation. And we're going to kind of split up today's talk into, into two different sessions. One is about the economics of soil health as it pertains to you as a producer, and then and then economics of conservation as it pertains to you uh, as a as a SWCD commissioner. Um, so we, we know that there are a lot of improvements to soil functions. We can reduce nutrients and pesticides. There's all kinds of research to show that, that, that by implementing these soil health principles, you know, minimizing disturbance, maximizing cover, maximize biodiversity, continuous living roots, and then integrating livestock when possible, we got tremendous benefits to the environment, tremendous benefits to, to a, a producer's bottom line. But the question that everybody always wants to know is, you know, can we make soil health pay? You know, everybody wants to know, uh, and particularly, they associate those soil health systems with cover crops. Um, and so, you know, in today's environment um, of, of li limited potential income or limited potential profit, everybody wants to know if a cover crop will pay. Most of the time, they only think of uh, the, the way that something can pay is if it has an impact increase in yield. Um, and so I think many times um, that those, that those uh, benefits to cover crops come not from increasing yield, but from reducing input costs. So today I want to try to w walk through uh, comparing several resource concerns, um, and there's, there's dozens of them out there. Um, we've picked a few right here, resource, reduce weeds, reduce compaction, uh, reduce fertility needs, um, prevent soil erosion and then livestock feed. Um, we just picked a handful to try to go through and, and, and talk about how, how, how people would deal with these issues from a conventional method and then how would we deal with them from a uh, soil health system and, and how do they compare uh, economically or financially from one method to the other. Um, so, so, so to start off, how much does a cover crop cost? You know, well, it depends, right? Um, depends on what you're trying to achieve with that cover crop. Um, you know, there's a range of anywhere from fifteen to fifty dollars. But I'm just going to say a good average cost is about thirty dollars. Would everybody everybody agree with that? About thirty bucks, right? So for our thirty dollar investment, if thirty dollars is the target, can we get a thirty dollar return on that investment for that cover crop? So let's start off with reducing weeds, right? Um, so to understand weed suppression. You know, how, how much does a typical uh, uh, chemical program cost uh, on a corn or soybean field across the state, right? Well, m maybe 50 or 60 bucks. It might, be, it might be cheaper in the north than in the north part of the state than it is in the south. But I'm going to say 50 or 60 bucks is probably a pretty typical cost um, across the state. So so to understand uh, weed control, we've got to understand something called uh, succession, uh, ecological succession, plant succession. Um, so here's a great picture. This is a field um, from North Dakota. Uh, it was planted to peas the year before. Then after harvest, they planted a cover crop on half of the field, and the other half had nothing. So the following spring, we've got these spring annuals on on half of it, but they're not growing on the other half of the field. So, so why why are we getting weed control on part but not the other part? So we have to understand um, those those seed germination factors, uh, and and those factors are temperature, moisture, and then the last one is light, and that's the one that we talk about a little bit, um, but we don't really we don't really utilize that necessarily as a tool to control weed. So if those if those weed seeds that are in that perfect germination zone, and most of the weeds that we have trouble with are a fairly small weed, right? So they're so they're fairly close to the surface of that soil, so they take quite a bit of light to light exposure to get them to germinate. So if we can have a, a cover crop um, that provides ground cover, it prevents that light from penetrating to those weeds, and it inhibits germination. So, so we've got a we've got a great opportunity, you know, to control those weeds without chemical. So I think I think initially. We're, we're always taught generally, you know, the, the, can, ha, what kind of a chemical to apply to a field after 
uh, the weeds come up, when in reality we need to prevent those weeds from germinating. Um, and so here's a couple great examples. Here's a picture of a field from northern Iowa. Um, tremendous weed control. A, a, a rye cover crop, soybeans planted into a rye cover crop. So how much sunlight is going to get to those weed seeds in an environment like this? You know, almost none. Right, and so then here's another one from uh, Ron and Michael Willis down just in the edge of Missouri. Um, you can see the right side; it looks like it has a better stand of of soybeans, doesn't it? When it when in reality, the reason the right side of this picture looks so solid green is because of all the uh, weeds in between the rows. So the left side of the picture had a cover crop on it; the right side did not. Um, no chemical applied to the to the field, but the suppressive effect of that cover crop had a tremendous impact on on uh, germination of those those uh, weeds that were that were fighting out there, and so that's why long term no tillers who use cover crops report cutting herbicide costs by thirty three percent. So if so if our if our total cost of our of our uh, chemical program was 60 bucks and we cut it by 33 percent that's about a 20 dollar uh, benefit you know and I've had and I've had several producers in the last couple years that have that have expressed to me that they that, that it was easy for them to cut out at least one chemical pass um, in, a, in a particular in a soybean program and and several have said that they totally eliminated uh, chemicals with a heavy cover crop um, and planted their soybeans into it, and these, and mind you, these were not organic producers. They weren't, they weren't not using chemicals um, because they were organic. Th they didn't have to use them, and they were a conventional producer. Now, is that going to happen every year? No, but if that's your purpose and your thought of of using those cover crops, you know, look, look at that opportunity right there. You know, that could eliminate a, a fifty or sixty dollar input cost, and our thirty dollar cover crop. That makes it look pretty cheap, doesn't it? So we move on to reducing compaction here. So compaction. So what's the what's the typical way most people deal with compaction? If you've got deep compaction, what's the what's the tried and true method? Get a big ripper, right? Get a big ripper, and those those things pull really easy. It doesn't take much fuel to run those, does it? Iowa State, MU, thirty bucks an acre ballpark, right? So that's pretty close to our cover crop cost, isn't it? So while we, while we know that we, when we see that ripper go through the soil, there's no doubt we can visually see that ripper fluff the soil, right? Loosen the soil. But now that we understand aggregate stability, and if you've heard any, any talks I've done before, aggregate stability is one of the top things we talk about. We now know that tillage reduces aggregate stability. Tillage chops and sizes reduces the biology that create those aggregates. So, so generally what we find is that while the ripper does fluff and loosen the soil, generally it collapses back in denser than it was to begin with before the first growing season is over. Okay, And so, so that's where our, our roots <coughs> come in. If we can have a cover crop, <coughs> the two things that roots do, the roots themselves leak exudates into the soil their roots will, will go down and fracture that soil. The root exudates act as a glue to hold that soil in place once it's been fractured so that it doesn't collapse and dissolve back in. Okay? And actually there's, there's all kinds of research to support that. This is Ohio State. They actually compacted it. They had, a, had, a, had no compaction here, 10 ton of compaction and 20 ton of compaction. They purposely compacted it and then planted uh, cover crops on part of it and subsoil. And in all three cases, the cover crop yield was better able to deal with the compaction than the ripper was. Okay, and, and so the researcher made this statement. You can't solve your problems with steel. Soil structure problems can be better solved by the natural rooting systems of cover crops. That's what fixed it to begin with. That's what built it to begin with was plants and roots, not just our cash crops, but a, a cover crop growing when we don't have a cash crop growing. Okay, so so we can we can make back that's thirty bucks. We can make back the cost of that. Okay, so let's let's talk about our 
our fertilizer, right? And we're going to come at this from a couple of different angles. So we got to understand nutrient efficiency in our soils. And this is something we kind of took for granted. But in reality, the nutrient efficiency in a tilled soil is much different than the nutrient efficiency in a no-tilled soil. Sir? So that's a great question about drying the soils out in the spring. A good cover crop, a good thick stand of cover crop can pull about an inch of water a day out of the soil. And so generally we can probably dry those soils out quicker with a cover crop, a living cover crop that's pulling moisture than you can simply by burying them and tilling them. You also, as you build aggregation in the soil, you build that internal drainage in that soil. Whereas tillage may bear it and dry the surface out, it also turns that soil, it reduces the structure and the aggregation in the soil. So it reduces the ability, the, the pore space, to air that soil out. Okay? Great question. So we got to understand the nutrient efficiency. So you got a plant root right here. You got a plant root. So, so if you got nitrogen molecules, phosphorus, water, it could be whatever, right, out in the soil. Which one is going to be more efficient at going out into the soil and grabbing nutrients? A root by itself or a root in combination with mycorrhizal fungi? Mycorrhizal fungi. The, the combination of the two, right, is going to be way more efficient. So what we've done in our tilled soils, tilled soils are very, very, they have a, they have a tremendously negative effect on this little fragile mycorrhizal fungi. So anytime we do tillage, we're going to reduce the amount of mycorrhizal fungi in that soil. So if we reduce the mycorrhizal fungi, we reduce the efficiencies of that soil. And I got another slide here in a second. So the other part of that is this, is if we don't have something green and growing out there, whenever, whenever we don't have a cash crop growing, anytime the soil is warm enough and has enough moisture for biologic activity, mineralization will be occur. Nutrients will be made available from that organic matter in the soil as well as any fertility that you add. So if we don't have something green and growing out there, when it's warm enough for that activity, for that biological activity, then guess what? That's where our leaching occurs. That's where the water quality issue comes in. So the biggest, the, the best solution to that is going to be a cover crop. Is going to be, is to mimic those natural systems that had a plant growing 365. Maybe they were not actively growing, but there was a plant root there grabbing up nutrients and holding on to those nutrients. So we need a, we need a, a catch and release system. We need to grab up the nutrients that are leachable when we don't have a cash crop growing, but then have, a, have it set up so that that cover crop decomposes and releases those nutrients back when our cash crop needs it. And we can do that. So you've got, you've got a cash crop or a cover crop growing here. Why has the cover crop got rows in it? That was residual nitrogen that was left over from the year before. What would happen to that residual nitrogen if you didn't have a cover crop in there? It would have been lost, wouldn't it? And that's, that's what's kicking our butt right now. So, so here's, the, here's the numbers, the efficiency of that. Most of the time they will show in a tilled system that added fertility, that nutrient cycle in the soil is only 30 to 50 percent efficient. Meaning that 50 to 70 percent of the added fertility and the mineralization that occurs of your organic matter does what? Goes out, goes out the end. Does not get taken up by a plant. We can change that as we go to a cover crop no-till system. Mimicking those natural systems, a living plant all the time, we can jump that to 80 to 90 percent efficiency, dramatically reducing our loss. Okay, <clears throat> phosphorus is the same way. There, there's a lot more soluble phosphorus than we've ever understood before, um, and the numbers are about the same: 50 to 80 to 90 percent efficient. Okay, so what's that mean from a dollar standpoint? What did our cover crop cost us? We said. 30 bucks, right? So, if, and this is Iowa State's numbers, average <laughs> nitrogen application across the state, 186 pounds at 38 cents. If we, can, if we can reduce that efficiency 
and save 40% of that, guess what? 28 bucks right there. Phosphorus, same thing. Save 40% of it by making our soil healthier, not as leaky. Healthy soils have a very tight nutrient cycle. There's not a lot of leakiness to them. Tilled soils are incredibly leaky because there's not a living plant there most of the time. Okay, so 38 bucks. So what our cover crop costs? 30 bucks. We can save that. Now, how do we, how do we save that? Guess what? We've got to start reducing our, our fertility inputs. And I wouldn't tell somebody year one, hey, go plant cover crops and cut your fertilizer by 40%. Wouldn't, wouldn't tell them that, right? But two or three years into this process, we've got a lot of guys <clears throat> that are starting to drop the phosphorus out. MU just did some stuff. Zero economic response to, to phosphorus in good, healthy soils. Terry Taylor over in Illinois, 30 years of no-till, zero economic response to phosphorus. Most of our Midwest soils have got three to five or 6,000 pounds of phosphorus in them. It's just not plant available. The biology are gonna make that available, okay? As we, as we get those soils healthy, that whole nitrogen protocol that we've been using changes, okay? Not only in how much we have to apply, but how much is gonna get leached and how much is going into the water, okay? So, so the other side of it is this, is maybe we could produce our own nitrogen, right? We've got a guy, this is Duke Kotwich, just in the edge of Missouri. Um, we've got folks in Iowa doing this a little bit as well. Um, pro produce his own nitrogen. This is a stand of crimson clover and uh, hairy vetch, okay? Now I'll tell you, a crimson clover hairy vetch stand is not gonna cost 30 bucks. It's probably gonna be more like 45 or so, okay? But to also to let it get this big, what's he gonna have to do to planting time? Probably gonna have to delay it just a little bit. Just gonna have to delay planting just a little bit. He's, he's getting it in the ground though, going through that material, okay? And so if we can produce 150 pounds of nitrogen at 38 cents, that's $57. Now, at $3.50, a bushel, that $57, that $57 translates into a trade-off of 16 bushel. So if we, could, if we could delay planting a little bit, give up seven or eight bushel, would that be money ahead? Even if we could get 30 bucks to pay for that cover crop, right? So, so this is the other side of it. Most people, most people say, well, yeah, but the research tells me I gotta plant early. You know, to get maximized corn yield, you got to plant early, okay? So why does the research tell us we've got to plant early? What's it trying to do to that corn to maximize yield? Keep it as long as growing as possible. Is it as long a growing season as possible? What really determines yield in corn? Two, th two things, moisture and, moisture and nitrogen, we understand that, but what times? V5 kind of sets girth and pollinization, right? Okay. So, so what, they're, what, what the research is telling us is that, hey, if you plant early, <clears throat> because your soils are so degraded, all the water's running off, your soils are bare, a lot of moisture is evaporating, the research is telling us that our water holding capacity and our water infiltration ability of our soils is really terrible. Because, hey, you got to plant early to get pollinization to happen early before the soils dry out. We've got guys planting later, pollinating later, because they've got much better soils, less evaporation, way better infiltration, and the heat doesn't bother the corn near as much. Because it can transpire, it can sweat, it can use the soil moisture and transpire and keep that productivity. Our, soil, our, our research is telling us you got crappy soil, soil conditions, right? So it's gonna be a trade-off. So prevent soil erosion. <clears throat> so what's the economic impacts of not doing it? That's what this one really looks at. Okay, nationally we've got a, a water and wind erosion rate of about 7.6 ton per year, per acre per year, nationally. That translates into about $40 per acre per year of nutrients lost, of nutrients, the cost to replace 
the nutrients that are lost in that 7.6 ton. $27 billion a year, okay? Yeah, but this is Iowa and it's really flat and we don't have near the erosion rate that the rest of the country has, right? Exactly. So Iowa, just looked it up, last night, the 2015 NRI shows 6.02 ton per acre per year combined wind and water, state average. Not on the low? Not on the low? I bet it's more than you think. $31 to replace the to nutrients in that, in that six ton, okay? Livestock feed. Livestock feed. This one's a no-brainer. Everybody knows, understands this one. It's a dual feeding system. It's going to feed the soil livestock as well as our, as our animal livestock. Most of the guys are telling us that, you know, they can pull about $100 an acre in grazing days off of that um, because your alternatives are stored feed in the winter, right? You're not, you're not comparing grazing a, a cover crop to grazing a grass in the summer. Grazing grass in the summer is cheap. Hey, stockpiled forage in the spring or fall or winter is what we're comparing it to. So it's pretty easy to get that $100 right there, okay? So, so the total, all the things that we looked at, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 38, 28, 32, 100, you know, $248. So what'd we say our cover crop cost? 30. 30 bucks. Do you, so do you think there's somewhere out of that 248 bucks that we can come up with $30 of benefit from our cover crop. You bet. And so there's a lot, that's a great point. Um, there's a lot of things we're gonna have to do slightly different up here. I think up here in this part of the world, the cover crops are gonna have to get planted before harvest. I think they're gonna have to get planted to maximize that growth and diversity and, and benefit. We're probably gonna have to go in it at, at like side dress time, V5, V4, V5 and plant them to get the benefit from that standpoint. We're going to have to fly them on uh, before harvest happens. Um, there's, you're, you're exactly right. But we there's people doing it all over. It's going to take some management. So. You bet. And we're going to get to that. You're talking about interceding in corn or soybeans? Interceding in the corn. Corn, yeah. Not, not so much into, into soybeans because of harvest heights, but potentially flying them on right before leaf drop in the soybeans. Because if you think about it, right, you go in and you plant them, you, you, you use a planter or drill to put the cover crop in post harvest. So then, okay, even if you're a couple of days behind the planter, you, you plant them, it takes four or five days to germinate, takes another four or five, six days to get very much growth before you start really getting much sunshine collection, right? Before it really takes off. Now you're two weeks past harvest or three, you know? And if harvest is, is very late at all, you just don't have enough growth. So that's why you gotta get them planted before harvest, either at, at, at side dress time or before leaf drop in soybeans, so that by the time harvest happens, you've already got a germinated seed, you've got a plant that's already got some leaf area, so as soon as that soybean or corn crop is taken off, boy, it's ready to ex get, get some sunshine and explode. We've been, we've been flying them out for 10 years. Some years, great, other years, yep. if you don't get a rain, that's, year, yep. <laughs> and that's And that's why generally flying is not is not nearly uh, we just don't recommend it as much as as putting it in the ground all right so just some some real world examples here so this is Rulon Enterprises which is in Indiana um, and again it's not Iowa but but, but it's still an I state right that can, does that count <laughs> um, he, he just has these are his slides he just has great numbers and so I just I, I love them um, so <clears throat> they have a, a pretty big operation 3,500 acres um, they try to get all of it in a cover crop. They use a variety of things. They fly some on, they drill some, they use ryegrass, they use some oats and radishes. So it's not just, hey, this is one thing. It's a variety of things. Um, <clears throat> they try to stay pretty cheap. As you can see, a $14 seed cost and, and a $12 planting cost for a total cost of 26 bucks. I think that's the thing that, that gets people is, oh, I don't want to plant cover crops, it's gonna cost me 50 bucks. You know, it, it doesn't have to. We've got to be really efficient. We've got to start working with our rates, probably dropping our rates down quite a bit. We're not producing grain, right? We're producing a ground cover, okay? 
So 26 bucks. Um, so this is, this is what the benefits are. So he's got all kinds of great data. He's got tile discharge, discharge data. He's got organic matter credit right here a little bit. He didn't even take anything for that. Um, his biggest things, he's got yield increases with test plots. And, and the one I love is this drought and stress tolerance right here. About every fourth year when it's dry, because of the resilience he's built into his soil, he can count on a 6.9 bushel yield increase over everybody in his area. Okay? Biology improvement, even if you don't take in this, the CSP money, he's, he's looking at $80, which is a return on investment of $300. $300, 300%. Three hundred percent. Is there is there is that a pretty good return on investment in today's world? Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Right? Not bad. So so here's Iowa State Ag decision maker that even looks at at the expenses associated with conservation tillage, corn and soybean, conventional corn and corn on corn, conventional corn on soybean, no-till soybean and corn. Okay. So they 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 looked at these expenses and came up with these break-even charts. So at 350 corn, a break-even for a no-till system, corn and soybean, is 156 bushel. A break-even for these two right here is corn and soybeans, 216, 217. Would you rather have a break-even of 216 or a break-even yield of 156? It, it's just coming down to inputs, guys, in, from, this, from this standpoint. It's not a production, it's an input deal. So here's, here's Wayne Fredericks over in Osage, Iowa. Long-term no-tiller. Wayne participates in a record-keeping program with, with a, a whole group of producers, about 100 producers. They all submit their receipts. The, the farm management company puts all the receipts in specific categories. So it's all apples to apples and oranges to oranges. He shows a $71 equipment cost per acre compared to his people in the, in the database group of 136 bucks. He's got a $65 per acre equipment savings, okay? Combine that with a $27 an acre, uh, an acre advantage for labor, and this is over eight years. This is not a one-year deal. This is eight-year average. $92 an acre cost savings, okay? For, for just, and this is not, this is not adding cover crops. This is just simply going no-till. Okay? County average yields, his 10-year average yields are better in both cases. So even if we even if we threw in that that at $8 soybeans, two and a half bushel, right? So what's that? 20 bucks, throw that 20 buck benefit to yield onto his $92 here and $3 for 4 bucks. So you're talking another 110 or 15 bucks per acre profit advantage for being no-till. You think you think 110 bucks is going to make a difference in today's economy on between black and red? You bet. Okay. Steve Berger down in Washington County, longtime no-tiller, longtime cover cropper. <clears throat> so almost a 30 bushel yield advantage. Six bushel on soybeans. And his CSR, his CSR is 77, and the county average is 82. So what's the math on that? 30 bushel yield, yield bump, average, average yield, 30 bushel at, at $3, right? Nobody wants to do the math on that. 100 bucks? Everybody, everybody says, uh... 100 bucks, soybeans, $8 soybeans at six bushel. There's another 40. Cover, you think, you think $140, you think that that, that that $30 cover crop pays for him, pays for itself with him, for, in his mind? So you ask Steve, hey, Steve, what does soil health mean to you? Ask him that very question. He said, it's one of the best management decisions we ever made was to get started and stick with it. And his dad's who started it, but Steve has taken it to a whole nother level for sure. It's like trying to put a value on your kids. You can't put a number on how valuable it is. Okay? So, so the bottom line is there's no doubt in my mind that, that for an individual 
to, to adopt a soil health system, cover crops and no-till, no doubt in my mind, if they will put some time and effort into it, it can be very much a, a, a money maker.